Hello everyone, welcome back to Reentry, an orbital simulator. This is a game that simulates the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions from the capsule view as if you were an astronaut in the spacecraft. And so you get to flick all the switches and do all the things. It has been a while since I last played this. I have landed on the moon with Apollo with it, but uh, on the return there were some issues. Uh, but we'll see, maybe uh, things are working okay now. There have been many updates and I intend to start from scratch. I'm, I'm gonna go through it and see how things have been changed. Uh, this has been a project that's been ongoing for Petri Williamson for seven years as this says and yeah it is ongoing and uh, it says that version 1.0 will be just the beginning and well I will give my feedback through this. Basically I'm almost certainly going to mess up somehow. And the interesting thing about simulators is what happens when you mess up, right? If you do everything by the book and it just does everything normally, that's one thing. But it's really interesting when you mess up what happens. Can you recover from that? How do the systems react? It's basically like if you stall an aircraft, does the aircraft do what it's supposed to do when it stalls? And then can you recover it from the stall the way you're supposed to? So, but of course this was spacecraft, so it's a little bit different. It's more about what happens when you press the wrong key. And that's very hard to simulate. So, we will see how it goes. So we're at update 0.96 here. And there are, very, I mean, there's been so many changes that we'll just go through it and see. So let me just check my settings. And this has been a little bit different. I do have track IR, so I'll be using that. Okay, render crew models, okay. Lunar rocks, fine. LRV wheel particles. High end launch complex 39A, certainly. And then this moon tessellation. Realism settings. Hover highlighter. Uh, yeah, well, I'll take the hover. Uh, that'll be good. Disable G-load. Structural damage and game over due to uh, heavy G-loads during entry and ascent. Uh, I don't know how well they simulate it. I'll just leave it off for now since it's off by default. Simplified burn and rendezvous. Automatic guidance corrections when logic detects accumulated errors or target offsets. I recommend leaving this on, especially with guidance computers being in their early stages. Okay, so... I guess, I mean, because we're in a certain state right now, it is not 1.0, we'll leave that be. Reduce Apollo launch camera shake. Uh, it's... might be okay, we'll see. Lunar landing point flag. Okay. Automatically face the lunar site. Well, that's fine. If enabled, the gyros will accumulate errors over time and will need to be corrected. So basically, enabling this is partly why you need the simplified burn and rendezvous. So, oh well. Okay. Um, there is an option for random failures. Well, that's exactly what we want. That's, uh, that is what makes things interesting, but for now, because we're testing out the basic systems and I'll probably create my own random failures, we'll just leave those off for now. Uh, this will enable orbital decay, testing only, mercury only. We'll just leave that off for now. And we'll let them test it, that. Okay, music. Well, I'll keep that low. I'm surprised it's not playing right now. They've got a whole mixer here. Color change when hovering switches. Rendered in the normal render loop. I guess that's probably good. I don't know what effect the normal render loop would have. Earth textures, low default or high 6 gigabytes memory. I think, I mean, I've got a 8 gigabyte card, but... Hmm... I think we'll just leave it low for performance reasons. And I do have track IR, so I'll enable that. 
Okay, so I think that's everything. So, Academy. Um, videos, YouTube, Project Mercury mission lessons. Let's just go through it like this. Uh-oh, I, I think I already clicked something. Okay, Track IR might be dangerous. Because <laughs> I might accidentally click things. Okay. Patrick, and I'll be your instructor here at the Academy. You are sitting in the Mercury space capsule on top of the Mercury Redstone launch vehicle. And I can turn off my track IR like that, so that's okay. Uh, you're currently, yep, the Mercury Redstone launch vehicle, yes. Look around, uh, well, I don't need to use a scroll wheel. Uh, divide in a few sections on the dashboard with a given color to easily know where to look. Yeah. Okay. And essential gauges, attitude information, earth path indicator, clock and timer, periscope. On the right, we have environmental controls. There's the suit fan and cabin fan and everything. Electrical power systems, warning lights, audio switches. Okay, ECS works in two separate circuits, one for the suit and one for the cabin. Even though the cabin is designed to sustain life for a few days, the pressure suit is your primary life support and will give you oxygen if the cabin leaks or is depressurized. Therefore, it is vital to have a pressure suit that can provide air, keep your body cool, and provide air circulation and odor removal. The ECS comes with two fans for the suit. Uh, number one is primary, number two is backup. Let's ensure the primary fan works. Okay, uh, right panels. Uh, locate the fan switch. Uh, normal control the fans automatically. You can force what fan to use by saying the fan switch number one or number two. Okay, one, number one. Number one. Okay, each supported spacecraft has a few predefined camera locations for easier maneuver around the cockpit. These are accessed by the view selector. I wonder what happens when I do that. Um, so, orbital. Okay, my track IR does not work in orbital view. Good. <laughs> uh, I, do, I can pan it with my mouse and use this scroll wheel. Command receipt, of course. The left panel view, I can still track IR that. And what happens to the commander seat? What often happens is if you're you set the track IR to a weird view initially, it doesn't stay centered in the uh, in the center one, in the commander seat one. So let's see, if I'm like this, go back to the commander seat. Yeah, uh, yep, that's okay. Seems okay for now. It doesn't get messed up. Okay. Rocket, rocket pyrotechnics. Pyros are armed by a squib switch. When armed, the isolated battery can power and trigger them. Arming the squibs are required to jettison and separate parts of the rocket. Arm the squibs now. Eek. Okay. Okay. The only pyro system that's not armed by the squib switch is the auto retro jettison switch. It's very sad to accidentally jettison the retro engines as they're required to get you back down to Earth. Extra security was added. Uh, arm the auto retro jet switch too. This should be on during ascent and after the retro burn. And that's because uh, they cushion the entry when you abort. So they need to be armed on ascent in case you abort. The capsule comes with three series of batteries. The main batteries, the standby batteries, and the isolated battery. The squibs are connected to the isolated battery. Let's ensure the isolated battery is working by checking that the voltage is over 28 volts. Uh, rotate the DC selector to ISO. Okay, this way. Right click to turn clockwise, it seems. Okay, that looks like 28 to me. Next to the attitude panel is the time zero button. This button is protected. Left clicking once will remove the protection. Right clicking will set the protection back on. Before launch, this protection should not be uh, should be removed so you can activate time zero quickly if the timer does not automatically start after launch. Player one. There are multiple 
Mm -hmm. Okay, there are multiple buttons similar to Time Zero button. Each are protected. Keep in mind that triggering them will lead to an irreversible action. Okay. I don't know why that would said player one, but... Okay. Press F7 for radio view. Um, well, that didn't do anything. The next system we will check is the radio communication system. Is there a radio? Oh, there's upper panels, window. It doesn't say radio view there. Uh, and and lights. The radio's down. The comm. Well, I can get there. Okay, the next system we'll check is radio communication system. It has two modes, UHF, HF, and the primary communication system is UHF. You can switch between them using the transmit switch. Verify it's set to UHF. Yes, it is. The capsule is equipped with two UHF systems. They are identical except the primary high-powered one is used using a booster to amplify the signal. It goes longer versus the low-powered one. Set UHF to high power. Okay, tap C to open the radio command menu. That happened, that's down there. <laughs> I don't know what angle I should use to look at it. Alright, I'll straighten up my back and go like this. This menu is used to send messages to the ground. The menu is visible just below the dark green radio control panel. Click the radio check and wait for response. 5x5 five five on UHF. Okay. Okay, and we'll test the low powered one. Radio check. Okay. Oh, oh, I clipped into the headrest there. Okay, UHF will not always be available during atmospheric entry. We will jettison the antenna, so we will need to use HF. Switch the radio to HF to ensure it works. Okay, so... Speak. Come on. Radio check. Okay. Okay, press M to view the mission scratch pad. This can be used to check mission details, map, radio transcript, and even write your own custom notes. It also has many checklists that you can follow. Yes, the checklists. There are a lot of systems to learn and understand, and today we've just scratched the surface. Don't worry if you don't understand the reason behind the switches we fill with today. I'm good. Okay. We have not ignited yet. Uh, let's exit session and go to the next one. I completed these before, but they marked them incomplete because I guess they've been redone. Welcome back, player one, in this lesson. I should change my name, maybe. Uh, I, I think I had set my name before, but now I'm player one again. In this lesson, we will go through all the steps required to launch, the procedures needed during the ascent, and what to monitor as the rocket lifts off. The ascent is an automated process, but emergencies can happen, so your task is to monitor all of the gauges periodically while being prepared for an abort. The capsule is now in the normal state while when you ingress the capsule before a mission. Uh, before you can fly, however, you need to perform a few final steps to prepare that cockpit as we learned in the previous lesson. Okay, so transmit set to UHF. Yes, it is. If you feel like you need more time before ignition, you can request a countdown hold by using the circular command. Oh, this is new. Um, Fuck started. Where's the countdown hold? Hold countdown. It's over there. <laughs> Good thing I have track IR, otherwise that uh, this thing will be in the way. Well, my hand, basically. Uh, but of course, if, uh, if I went to the radio... If there was a radio panel... I would be able to see it. But okay, hold countdown is a thing. Remember, remember to resume if you use this feature. Yeah, we're in 3 minutes 32 seconds here. During ascent, depending on the launch vehicle, you will go through different stages to reach the velocity required for the mission. The squib bus uh, needed to ar be armed for this, so arm the squibs. Okay, arm the squibs. And arm auto retro jettison. Now we are ready for the launch itself. Resume countdown if you use this feature and set the launch control switch uh, to ready. Ready player one. Uh, so ground knows they can trigger the ignition. If this switch is ready, the rocket will launch when the countdown reaches zero. 
You can use the time scale to reduce waiting time unless you are in a powered or critical mission phase. This is triggered by using the 1, 2, etc. keys. You can press 0 to pause the game. Try setting the time scale to 2. Okay, so time scale in the upper left corner is 2x. And then 1 to return. If you have done everything as told, the rocket should be ready for ignition. Once the countdown reaches T-0, the clock will uh, the rocket will start to climb and some automatic systems are started. One of them is the time from launch. I mentioned clock because I was thinking about it. Uh, time from launch timer is located below the analog clock uh, on the timing panel. Once you are gaining altitude, immediately monitor the time from launch clock and check that it has started counting. When you see it counting, uh, report this to the ground by using the radio menu. Clock started. And you see that down there. Otherwise, I would break the time zero thing and start like that, presumably. They didn't actually tell me to do that, but... That is probably because that is not a failure we expect to see happen. I'll just gaze around and wait. Put my head out. <laughs> well, oh, I can really get a good view there. We could go to external view. There we are. There's the suborbital Mercury launch, as you can see. I mean, we're not going to go too far for the suborbital launch, but it'll be interesting to see the map work, assuming that works. I don't think the last time I tried this that that worked at all. Okay, it seems like we're going. Okay, so time has started. Oh, I didn't say it. I didn't say the the audio had started it. Okay. I think I clicked the button properly. Two fuel tanks, one for the autopilot, one for the manual control. We saw that. Oh, where did it go? There. Yeah. Manual and auto. Fuel quantity indicator should say at 100% for both auto and manual. I mean, unless I decide to do some manual stuff. Above the fuel gauge, you'll find the accelerometer. That's there. This will usually climb up to 5 or 6 for orbital ascent. Right now we're still less than 2. Less than a suborbital ascent like today. Well, on the way up. On the way down, it's going to get pretty high. The cabin is now fully pressurized with pure oxygen. This will bleed off over time. Ensure this is decreasing and stabilizing at 5.5 psi during the ascent. So, actually, uh, previously I think they had mentioned that um, yeah, it's bleeding off from the outside cabin pressure, uh, outside pressure, which is 14.7. So we see it dropping below 6. Well, the audio is synced to, I guess, Alan Shepard's, I forget. I think that's probably Alan Shepard. Um, there were two suborbital flights. I think that's Shepard talking. Uh, so yeah, it looks stable and our oxygen is there and I guess it'll drop down eventually. Pitch program will automatically pitch the rocket along the ascent path. Ensure this happens by checking the pitch needle. It shouldn't go straight down to zero. It goes a little bit of pitch so that, you know, we end up over water and everything. And also coming straight down is harsh, so you want to be coming down at a bit of an angle. The capsule has two oxygen tanks, one primary, one secondary. The ECS is controlling them automatically. And we are done with the burn. Okay, when the primary tank is empty, you'll switch to secondary. They're, they were 100%. Healthy battery, 24 volts, and we can check that. Uh, I trust it. Those are the other ones. Okay, we've separated. I don't know. It didn't say what which one to select. Okay, we have separated, and it should automatically going be going to the correct orientation. So if we take a look externally, this is how we are. 
monitor this right after liftoff to ensure that you're climbing. Yeah, well, we we're way past that. Uh, counting air temperature, it's fine. Orange means it's processing or something in need of uh, attention. Green is step complete. Power is jettisoned, yes. Capsule separated, yes. Ascent complete. Capsule will rotate 180 degrees in yaw. It did something. Okay. Oh, and that's that. Oh, I wanted to know if we would actually survive that. <laughs> they have a little translational test in the corner there. Just to check. Okay, that seems okay. Don't know about sensitivity, but we'll get to that later. Okay, continuing. So, they say it's completed. I, I want to change my name, darn it. Um, profile. Capsule name. Um, I'm just got... Uh, Snoopy is a good name and has been used, but darn it, Snoopy 1. Maybe Snoopy 3. Snoopy 3. Alright, Snoopy 3. I don't know why multiplayer rankings are like that. Character editor, I wonder what that does. There's a character editor. Oh. Um, I seem like I have an invisible character. <laughs> Peak position. Okay, that's not working. Forget it. Forget it. We won't do that. <laughs> It's uh, it's probably in early state anyway. It's fine. There aren't any mirrors, I don't think. Okay, checklists and atlas ascent. Hey, welcome to the Atlas rocket. This is a much larger launch vehicle than the Redstone launch vehicle. It has enough thrust and propellant to take you into orbit around Earth. Today we will launch it while learning about the checklist system. The cockpit is the same as in the redstones, so the procedures are identical. We will use the checklist found in the mission pad to follow realistic procedures during preparations and ascent. Press M and read the briefing tab for a primer on the checklist system, then click on the checklist tab when ready. Start by holding the countdown. Okay. Eek. Hold. Okay, we have held the countdown at four minutes. I'm, oh, I'm just one second off from the normal four minute hold, <laughs> darn it. Okay, anyway. Uh, all right. Uh, use the radio, yeah, we did that. The only checklist we need to follow today is the final checks checklist. So T minus five final checks. Okay. Yes, we did that. Checklist guidance system is a game mechanism designed to help you with executing the checklists. It will help you find the switches you need to need to verify or change. Let's try to run the checklist by using the checklist guidance system. Ensure the final check checks checklist is open. Yes, run the run. Yeah, run. Okay, Roger. Okay, and then we will have the UI little thing popped up and the buttons highlighted. If the background of the current step is green, as it is now, the checklist guidance system will by default automatically proceed to the next step if the switch is in the correct position. This auto proceed feature can be disabled in the realism settings. Um, let's just leave that be. The auto proceed feature basically just... The auto proceed feature basically just press the checkbox button on the right side for you when the... Yeah, that doesn't seem right. When the game detects that the step has been completed. If you disable the auto proceed system, you will need to press this button manually after performing the step. Most of the steps in the checklist supports the auto proceed feature. However, there are some that you will need to press the check mark manually. There are, these are usually related to checking values, performing radio tests, and so on. Basically, if the background of the current step is flashing, it means you will need to manually press the check mark to proceed to the next item in the checklist. You will try this soon. Resume the countdown and try to complete the first step in the checklist. With R proceed enabled, the checklist will automatically move to the next item. If this item is already in the correct position, it will move to the next step immediately. So resume countdown. Okay. Follow each of the steps in the checklist uh, guidance UI to complete the checklist. When you reach the radio check steps, 
the active line will flash at this point use the radio command menu and press radio check when complete press the check mark yes okay uh launch control ready form radio test on uhf so we are on uhf it doesn't say hi uh i remember doing hi first so i'll do that Okay, and I'll do low too. And we'll just stick to high. Okay, yes. Verify z uh, zero uh, time zero button cover removed. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, DC selector battery one. Seems like it's battery one, and that's 24 volts. Okay, arming squibs, arm, and auto retrojection. Okay, so that's all done. We've got 2 minutes and 45 seconds. Get rid of the tab, and enjoy the view. The stuff for Gemini and Apollo are way more complicated than this, so... Don't be thinking that, oh, this is so simple, a few little flick switches. I mean, obviously Mercury is the easy one, so do not be complacent. Okay, here we go. Let's keep an eye on the time from launch. Okay. Clock is operating. We're oh, underway. Oh, where's my cursor? Yes, okay. Clear. Roger, we're programming and roll okay. Okay. A bumpy along about here. That seems like a different audio. Stand by for 20 seconds. Roger. Okay, Two, we monitor one, things. Mark. So, cabin pressure should be decreasing. Cabin O2 will go to its position. Another step in the Atlas Ascent is the booster stage. This is considered a half stage and will only remove some weight as our two booster engines used for initial ascent are no longer needed. Indeed. See the acceleration there? Altitude down there. A bit shaky. I'll get rid of the view selector. Okay, cabin pressure 5.5 psi. Not there yet. Seven. It's uh, still pretty light outside. Okay, now it's 5.5 ish. We are approaching 3 G's. Not quite there. Booster engines should drop off at about 2 minutes and 14 seconds, I think. So at that point, our acceleration will drop. The highest acceleration is right at the end with the sustainer engine bleeding the last bit of propellant that it can. Okay, approaching 4 G's there. Oh, past 4 G's, 4.5 G's. And there we go. Uh, a little bit earlier than I thought, but that's alright. Still lots of thrust. Once the tower separates, I can't even see the tower. Oh, there it is. Uh, you will do an additional step to prevent the retro engines to jettison accidentally. Well, turn off that switch, probably. Jettison power is green. Okay, so let's click that. Then disconnect the power by opening the circuit using the retro jettison fuse on the right side. Over here. Uh, circuit breaker has three positions. One up, off, middle, two down. Set to off. Isn't this already off? Oh, this way. Two down. Okay, so yeah. Alright, Roger. Additional security around your retro engines. They are your only tool to get back to Earth once you are in orbit. 
I don't know, we could rock back and forth using the RCS. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. Uh, you work through the checklist, you might find the need to to move it around the screen. I've already gotten rid of it. Uh, finding a spot on it that does not have an active UI element such as a button scroll view. Drag it around. Yeah, I know how to drag things around. For rest of Ascent, monitor the instruments and try to learn as you are ascending into orbit. Uh, this lesson ends on capsule separation. Yeah, well, and that should happen T plus five minutes or so. Okay, just about done here, I think. A little bit past five minutes now. Our altitude is, well, it's above 100,000 feet, but that's not really saying much. Oh, there we go. Off at 5 minutes 17 seconds. Okay, that's the end of that. We got to orbit. But there's more to be done. Electricity, attitude, control, staying alive, sequencer, full mission. Um... Let's do electricity this time, and then I'll continue the rest next time. Okay, so we're already in space, and it's orienting right now on its own. Okay, electricity lesson. Various systems and components related to electrical power systems. Uh, we'll make a quick reconfiguration of the all-pod, as we will be depowering important components the ASCS is depending on. You should have said what the ACS, uh, ASCS is. Okay, but it's the autopod system. Uh, aux to aux on. Um, that's that. There's normal, there's aux on, and there's fly-by wire. Uh, fly-by wire would allow us to maneuver it, and it would just uh, interpret my input as thruster uh, uh, for the thrusters. Of course, my input would not directly control a specific thruster. The computer still has to decide which thruster to fire to do what I'm intending to do. Uh, we will cover the RCS in the next lesson, but this will disable the ASCS auto attitude mode. So with aux on, it's not going to automatically hold things. The uh, Mercury space capsule comes with an electrical system that is capable of producing both DC and AC electricity. DC direct current is supplied by six rechargeable silver zinc batteries, each at 24 volts. The main batteries are connected to the main DC bus. The main DC bus is responsible for distributing electrical power to most of the onboard systems. Three of these batteries are wired in parallel and are considered your main batteries. If your main batteries should fail, you have a backup standby battery, two wired in parallel, that will keep you powered for a while. The last battery is called the isolated battery and is used to give power to your very important squibs. The squibs are the system that powers the pyrotechnics for separation and jettison. Uh, you can check the status of the battery by using the volts gauge and you can see here um, we have uh, battery 1, 2, 3, the standby 1 and standby 2 and the isolated battery so those are the 6. Okay, then they want us to go back to 1. And it should be at 24 volts. A low voltage on one of the batteries is a good indication that something's wrong with it. If this happens, it's a good idea to switch over to the standby batteries for safety and turn off the battery. Let's pretend battery 1 is broken, showing a low voltage. Uh, first switch over to first switch over to the standby battery. That's on. And that's on. Connect the standby batteries to the main DC bus. The switches that connect the switches that connect the batteries to the electrical system are located on the left. Where? Where? I don't know where that dot is trying to say. Left and right side of your seats. They can be hard to reach. Okay. Okay. Well, it's a good thing I have track IR. <laughs> uh, but set main one to off. Okay. Roger. When you're on the standby batteries, you will need to conserve power. Let me just take a look at those again. So the isolated batteries on top, main 
that's main three, that's main one down there. And then on the opposite side, ugh, we have the other ones. Interesting that the main two one, the switch is oriented differently. Okay, when you're on the standby batteries, you need to conserve power. We will not do this now. This is done by shutting down systems. You don't need, like, the blood check, ASCS, the lights, etc. A uh, flashlight is always available and can be toggled using F. Flashlight. Uh, the flashlight will look in the direction of the view, but will also follow the mouse cursor. Okay, and then turn it off. An important detail is that all flight modes that operate the two RCS systems are based on DC power except manual propulsion manual mode. If you're having issues with your electrical system, use this to control the capsule. So, uh, well, I suppose that'll tell us. I mean, the, that's ASCS. Attitude select. What was the manual? Uh, well, there's a. Uh, that's for track scope. Mm. Well, I guess we'll get to that on the RCS. Uh, lecture. Tutorial. Alright, if you're having issues with the standby batteries as well, you have a final option to connect the isolated battery to your main bus. This is done by setting the isolate switch, isolate switch, to standby. So that'll feed it into standby, which feeds it, feeds it into the main bus as long as the side my switch is on. Okay, well I guess we'll do that. Turn off all systems that you don't need to keep you alive. Uh, you can use the M meter to see how much power you're consuming. Anyway, avoid using the isolated battery this way at all costs. If you have to, try to wait until you're preparing for re-entry. The source of the M meter is controlled by the same knob. Oh. And one no longer shows any voltage or amps. Two still does. Three does. Standby. And the isolated battery has a lot of volts. It's 28, I think. Set the standby battery to off. Isolate battery should still be normal then. Reconnect, reconnect main battery 1. Oop. That's why its voltage was 0, because we turned it off. I can't get my head back over there. Uh-oh. There we go. Yeah, oh, I should have done isolate battery to normal afterwards. Okay. The ASCS and the fans require alternating current. Alternating current is generated from DC using inverters. We have one inverter that provides 250 volts at 400 hertz to the ASCS system, one AC inverter that provides 150 volts for the fans, and one final standby inverter that can provide 250 volts for either the ASCS or the fans. You can check the status of the AC system using the AC volts gauge, and that only goes to 150. Rotate the AC knob, so there's the fan, standby, ASCS, 150 volt, 100, uh, 250 volt. If one of the inverters goes down, the standby inverter will kick in and illuminate the standby AC auto light. So that's that light there. You can control what AC bus is used to use for the ASCS by saying the ASCS uh, AC bus to either standby, off, or norm. Keep it at norm. You can also control what AC bus to use for the fans by setting the fans AC bus to either standby, off, or norm. Keep it at norm. Having fans selected on the AC volts, well, it is on fans, uh, you see that they show 150. Set to standby, oop, standby. Nothing is connected to standby inverter, so it should read zero. It does. Set the fan's AC bus to standby. Now the standby reads 150. You can do the same for the ASCS. Should I? 
The standby inverter can power both ASCS and the fans. However, to avoid overloading the system, shut down all systems that are not critical for ASCS. Set the fans AC bus to normal. And then set that to normal. I never switch it to standby anyway. Uh, let's finish by talking about power consumption. Make sure the M meter is set to main. Okay. Power consumption should always be on your mind. As mentioned, the power consumption by your systems can be read on the M meter. Try to set the ASCS AC switch to off. You'll notice the impact on the M meter. Yes, it dropped. Fewer amps are being used. The maneuver switch on the lower left side of the panel uh, is used to turn off or on the gyros. Saying this to off will reduce power consumption. Check the ammeter. Well, okay, first of all, ammeter is at like 32 ish. That's off now. And it's like 30 ish now. Fuses are also a way to turn off systems. Most systems have one or many fuses connected to it. Each fuse switch has three positions, off and one, off and two. Each system connected to a fuse has a primary fuse and a backup fuse. Locate the highlighted programmer fuse and set it to the off middle position. That's the middle position. And Wow, okay, so the top position, we were at 30 amps. On the off position, we dropped to like 24 amps. The system isn't working, and sure the fuse is set to 1. If the system is still not functioning, uh, set the fuse to 2. If the system is still having issues, it can be something else or that both fuses have blown. That seems unlikely, uh, but I guess... In the event of a lightning strike, who knows? Uh, pay good attention to the various battery states, power consumption, and react as soon as possible if you see something strange. Electricity produces a lot of heat, so pay attention to the cabin temperature indicator to avoid unpleasant situations like an electrical, mal electrical malfunction, smoke, or a fire. On the mission pad checklist, you will find a dedicated section for emergencies called emergency procedures. Wow, there's an emergency procedures one. Find a section now. Let's find the electrical power systems emergency procedures orbit. Okay. I don't remember this part from before. Environmental control system emergency operations. Okay. Being familiar with this section. Okay. Oh no, I was wanting to read it. Uh, maybe they, I wonder if they have a priority list for what we should turn off, like turn this off first to save power kind of thing. But okay, mission accomplished. It's got a little fuel graph there, but I didn't really do anything. Okay, exit session. All right, so I'll leave it there for now. We did the first, uh, not the missions, we did the first Academy lessons for Mercury. Next time we'll try to get to the examination. And so, but that'll probably be quite involved, so keep that in mind. I'll try and go through quickly, but it might take some time. And then uh, we will see about the suborbit. I think we would probably skip the suborbital ones and just go for the orbital ones. Atlas, that's a prototype one. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see about those. There's a campaign, Orbital Survival. Hmm. Anyway, uh, the lessons first. <laughs> the lessons first. I will go through the lessons and then we will see which of the other features we will go through. All right. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I will see you next time.